are. We are live. Excellent. We've got the go. Brilliant. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Hugh Harvey, and I've been selected for some reason to, to vaguely steer the conversation this evening. We've got some old faces and some new faces. Uh, let's go through the new faces. We have uh, Nina Kotler, who is a legend in her own right in the radiology AI world. She's going to be uh, explaining some of her experiences of trying to orchestrate and implement AI across RAD partners, which, which many of the Americans will know is one of the larger radiology networks in the US. And welcome, Nina. Hi. Um, we've also got with us another legend, um, someone who's been doing data science and, and medical imaging informatics for longer than I've been alive, probably, is Rain Geis. Uh, you're based out in Colorado, is that, is that correct, yeah. Rain? Yeah. Brilliant. Welcome. Brilliant to have you here. He's going to be talking about what he calls the goons. We'll explain that later in the conversation. Um, and then some, some, some previous faces, if you've been tuning into our happy hour sessions, we've got Matt Lundgren, who's an assistant prof over at the Amy Center, and uh, Sharon Zhu, who's back again with, with her data science insights as well. Um, and I think we've got Joanna Kim online on standby in case we've got any technical issues. And last but not least, no introduction needed, Luke, Oaks and Rayner who's got up nice and early for us um, down in South Australia. Hi, Luke. Hey. So, guys, we're, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to start off with a question. And then you guys can just butt in and answer. Um, and the question is something that we were sent around. Let me just check my email. What was it? Yes. What do you guys think about model facts labels for AI systems? You mean just in general or as a requirement or come on, give it, give me something to work with here. I'm trying to tease, tease out. There's, there's two different angles we can take it. There was a paper in nature, which I quite like saying, this is what a model facts label should look like. Or we can go down the requirement, the regulatory route and say, should the regulators be mandating that vendors tell the public what they've told the regulators? I mean, I feel like if you're saying if I pick up a, a package of, you know, saltines at a gift store or whatever, and I can see all the ingredients, that's the least that they could probably offer for a model that affects hundreds of thousands of people potentially in an implementation. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I mean, I guess if you put it that way, it makes perfectly <laughs> obvious sense. Anyone else? I actually think that having the data available just out there in public is never good enough. I mean, it's nice when you're buying saltines that it has it right there and it's on the box, but when you're actually using an AI model, you're not reading the box. So when I think about how do you actually employ the information that is buried deep in the AI and have more than explainable AI, I think it needs to happen at the radiology workplace. And, and we've experimented with that, with that in our practice because we've got an AI tool we've been working on. And, and I think it needs to be built in with what the RADs do every day. Brilliant. Can I just say that I don't know what saltines are? There must be something that you can... <laughs> I'm, guessing, I'm guessing you can eat them. Uh, I, said crum never... I can say crumpets. Is that better? Do you get... <laughs> ah, yeah, crumpets. Crackers. Crumpets. Crackers. Good. Good. We've had a comment actually in the chat for what are model facts? So who, who would like to answer that, that question? Maybe we should have started there. We should have. I, so yeah, absolutely. The, the audience may not know what model facts are, right? But uh, the idea is you can distill down the information in a model into a minimum amount of information you need to provide to consumers. So something that is easily understandable, like the back of a, a food package, uh, and that can give you enough information to decide whether you're going to use that model or not. Um, I'm not, I, I like the idea. Uh, I find that when you try and put it in practice, it gets very complicated to work out what that minimum set of facts should be. Um, you know, in, in the ML community more broadly, there's been a couple of papers now on uh, data sheets for data sets and, uh, you know, model sheets for models and so on. Um, and all of that information is important. And I'd go even further. I'd say you probably need like a task sheet for tasks as well. And, and so even to just provide a minimum description of, of what this AI is doing, how it should be used and so on, you'd end up with a very long sticker to put on your AI. Uh, you know, it's, we're talking probably several pages now, um, which doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, mesh with this idea of a very simple uh, label you can just stick on something for people to easily understand. 
So I'd say maybe AI is, is still complicated at the moment. We don't quite know what to put on these labels. And doesn't that doesn't that raise the point of you know to, to Nina's uh, discussion earlier? I mean, if if this is this is assuming that you've frozen a model and this is going to be the same thing in perpetuity, and as we all are seeing, I mean, continuous learning is being you know increasingly raised, and we're talking about changing it to match certain situations. So I guess is it best just to have that for baseline models then that you take and manipulate yourself, and then that raises the regulatory questions, right? I guess it depends on who we think the audience is for these model facts labels. Um, clearly, some people want to know more about the data science, these statistics. Others will want to know the data sets. Others will just want to know what actually is the claim being made here and what is it allowed to be used for. So I guess you have to tailor it to the audience as well. Sorry, so, Nina, I interrupted. Oh, that's OK. I mean, I'm a rad, so I, I think about it from the rad and user perspective. But what I want to know as a rat is not what the overall sensitivity and specificity or false negatives, false positives are. I want to know where is it going to work for me and where is it not going to work for me. And, and that is the kind of detail level you want to get to. If you just put everything on a label, like Luke was saying, it would be pages long. It would be insane. We've actually been playing around with this idea at our practice because we have an AI model that's out there. And what we have is a little assumption section of that model. And the assumptions are, what are the assumptions that are being made by the tool that the RAD should know about? The black box and how it got to its decisions. So as an example, if you dictate on one case, let's say you're talking about an aortic aneurysm and you happen to give three measurements. It's 4.3 by 4.5 by six centimeters. Well, they, the model is gonna take the six centimeters and assume that's the length. And it will take the biggest of the other two, but you should know that. And it's only gonna tell you that if, you did take it away. It should be, you know, not alert, uh, alert overload, but it should be very specific to what you're actually seeing and how that model is working. Excellent. We lost you for two seconds in the middle there, but we got we got the point of what you were saying, and I and I do agree as well. I've just put a link to the to the paper in Nature that describes um, model facts. I put it in the YouTube chat there. Um, Sharon, did you have anything to add uh, yeah, um, on that? Because clearly, if model facts got mandated as a requirement, it's going to be up to, I guess, part of the data science team to sort of fill in the gaps and decide what they want to put in there. So how, how do you think that you might approach it from your angle? Yeah, so I actually have a much more positive outlook on model facts than other folks here, I believe. Um, because I think the alternative is nothing right now. So I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, and uh, just for the audience, um, you have to like you have to write out you know the outcome, the output, your target population. You have to give various uh, metrics on performance, on kind of uh, prospective and retrospective uh, studies. And uh, I I think from the computer science and machine learning world, if this didn't exist, I'd be worried about some of the things coming out that people just don't even know what to fill the in the blank with, you know, they don't even know some of these things exist. Of course, they work with, even if they work with doctors, they might not know. And that's really concerning. And in taking this as an analogy to the self-driving car world, um, something that I'm very concerned about is with Tesla being, or Tesla saying, you know, we have autopilot. It completely drives itself now. And that, that's what it says in the marketing, right? And people have, people have died because of it. And, um, and now NHTSA needs to regulate it in various ways. But what if there was a card that told you what the AUC was what the and what the accuracy was of its autopilot on various things? I would love to have seen that. And then there would be no way those claims could have gotten as far. And I think um, something I'm also a bit concerned about is who regulates this? Is it the FCC? Is it the FDA? Is like, who's going to be the one where you go to for sure who needs to ensure that companies are putting out or, or organizations are putting out something accurate um, and actually putting it out as well. So I think it's a step in yeah. the right direction. So on that, on that last point on, on who regulates it. So the pharmaceutical industry, at least here in the UK, there's a, there's an independent body called the ABPI and they actually will look at all the claims that drug companies are making and read their materials and their advertising. And I'm wondering, do we think that there may be some kind of body set up like that for AI? 
you know, the FDA is doing that in the United States. I mean, has been tasked with that in the United States. And they've said up front, you know, when we first started talking to them about this several years ago, you know, they hadn't, they didn't know about machine learning. They, I mean, they were honest about it. And they didn't know how they were going to uh, figure out how to regulate it. Um, especially if you're going to do continuous learning, but leaving continuous learning to the side. Um, we've seen them do things now where they're, they're two different parts of FDA. There's clearance and approval. And clearance is based on something else. And everybody today is getting clearance, not approval. And what that means in general is that they've taken the old breast CAD and said, well, what we're doing now is kind of like that. And so uh, uh, give us clearance. And the FDA has done that. And it's on, sometimes on very sparse data. I mean, I think the short answer is the FDA hasn't done its job in terms of figuring out whether these are safe or not, uh, or whether they work well. Um, but to the FDA's credit, they realize that they need to do a different kind of job than they're doing right now. Um, how that's going to play out, we don't know. Yeah. Um, Very valid think, point there. Yeah. Sorry, Luke. I think that's an important. No, yeah, I think that's an important point that um, you know we look at say what gets done by the regulators, so the FDA or uh, in Europe and so on, or we even look at published research papers by tech companies by by startups that are producing these models. And it's like those multi, you know, eight page, 10 page papers already don't give us enough information about these models and already aren't providing the sort of stuff that you'd need to, uh, you know, be able to make a decision as a user. And I'm not, you know, you don't need to have tons of, you know, AUC measurements and stuff like that necessarily as a user. I agree with that. But if you look at the paper that I'm sure we're going to be talking about that came out yesterday about mammography, uh, the supplement contained human readable information about those models. And uh, that's the first time I've ever seen that, that everything else was you know, fairly technical heavy uh, as it is in all these papers. Uh, and it doesn't include this stuff that we'd need to put on these labels. So uh, I still feel like this is an incredibly difficult problem. And, and, and um, for sure, like the, the regulators aren't doing what they need to here. Uh, as, as Rame said, this, this idea that you can just sort of hark back to a model from sometimes the 1970s or 1960s to do a task which is very different than the task we're doing and say that it's similar enough that we don't need to get approval uh, is, is weird. But that aside, th you know, this, we already have this struggle of presenting the right sort of information in papers and you look at any paper and, and there's always gaps in it. So if we try and condense that down into a, a tiny card, there's just going to be more gaps. I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to see it in practice. Yeah, I think we can all agree that we're never going to agree exactly what should go in a label, but we all agree that there should be at least some kind of label. I think we can probably leave that topic there um, on that bombshell. And there is a nice segue from a question we've got via YouTube from a chap called Sean Doyle, um, who says, you know, uh, you might have images coming in from other institutions with different protocols and different vendors. And I guess this is going to segue into the topic of how generalizable are these systems? How do we test for generalizability and robustness? Do we need to? Do we need to deploy different AI models at different hospitals? What on earth is the answer? Raim, I know you've got some strong opinions on this, so, so I, I thought I might come to you first. Well, the old adage is that these things work, but they don't generalize. It's really easy. It's spooky how easy it is to you know go to one of the libraries and pull down code and build something that works on your own data. And, you know, it's just magic. Um, but then you give it to your friends and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't because each imaging device, acquisition device has its own pixel fingerprint, both of acquiring the data, usually, you know, sinusoidal data, if we're talking about CTs or MRs, and then doing the reconstruction. Um, so they have different pixel patterns and features. Well, if I'm built my algorithm and I 
use it on somebody else's pattern of pixels if the variations that they have are in places that I'm not saying are important in the features that I'm using in my algorithm, it will work fine. But uh, sometimes there are changes in the pixel patterns that uh, my algorithm has decided are important. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work. Um, adversarial images sort of overlap into this. Um, but you know, the bottom line is that that's a huge problem and we don't know how to do it. I guess going back to your deal about the, the uh, model facts, I, I, I think that we need, I think of this in terms of uh, that we need an independent verification and validation system for this stuff or IV and V. That was the thing that was initially developed probably uh, to evaluate ballistic missiles or other complex systems and the, aer uh, the aeronautic industry uses that, you know, like Boeing does, FAA does. Now they failed in the 737 MAX. There's a great paper by Mark Coley and John Mongren about describing that. But uh, I think, you know, we should probably start look talking to systems engineers and figure out how to build our own IV and V process for how to do this, especially as we start getting more complex systems. Right now we're just using, the ones we're doing are really sort of one-off and they're narrow and they're almost prototypes that we're learning from as much as we're actually throwing out and using in production, so. Excellent. Nina, your, your at Red Partners, are you coming across generalizability problems due to the wide geography of your footprint? Generally, that, that tends to be a problem. Um, you know, it's been written about quite a bit. It's called the brittleness of, of AI and the whole idea that we don't want to overfit a model to a certain, whether it's patient population, disease prevalence population, um, certain type of scanner or that can change so widely. And so you try to create something that really has a more generalizable amount of data for all of that. Frankly, I don't think it is really that realistic to expect that we can just have a great model that is going to be accountable for everything. I think what happens when you have a model that is that generalizable, it's not gonna be as good as an overfitted model on a certain population. So it's a give and take really. And you just have to decide where in your group you're, you're willing to kind of lie with that. What we tend to do with ours is we pre-test our model on the next group that we're rolling it out to before we actually roll it out. So we're not just rolling it out live and saying, here you guys, you know, it should be 95% accurate, um, but, but we don't really know how accurate it is for you if your dictated reports are a little bit different than the ones that we taught it from. So we'll roll it out first in the background and then teach the tool and then roll it out more specifically. We, we also do a lot, and I think this is a really important point, we do a lot with radiologist education because there's always going to be parts of the model that don't work and don't work well. And we kind of know what some of those are. After doing it long enough, you realize where the errors lie. And you can tell the radiologist ahead of time and build that into your training. And I think that's really important because the model, the AUC, the accuracy on its own with your training data is only half the answer. The other half the answer is how does it fit into your workflow? How does it work with the individual radiologist or people really going to be using it and are they using it in that way? I mean, there was a great article a few months ago about Google's um, AI that they had for diabetic retinopathy and said it worked really great in the lab, you know, but when we rolled it out, it was a different story. And a lot of that was related to the workflow. You know, I, Absolutely. your point, I, I feel like that's the, that's the key question, right, is, is the interaction. You know, we've even found that you can use the same model and the same data set and present it in a different way and you get a completely different uh, decision by the radiologist, right? Or the person using it. I guess I'm curious, you know, if you did roll it out and say that you had some comfort with the performance, right? And everyone's educated, everyone feels great. How do you continue to monitor the performance? So, you know, if we have a CT scanner, we are scanning every morning a phantom to make sure that we have some baseline understanding of how it's doing. 
Do you have a checks and balances? Is this something that you guys, I'm assuming you're shaking your head, you have. I'd be curious to hear about that because I think that's something that a lot of us are asking ourselves and each other. How do we continue to monitor the performance of these and then know where to pull them out? Right, so that is really important. It's important for two reasons. It's important one, because no matter what, your, your data is gonna change over time and you have, it, like monitoring once in time is not a good enough. You have to monitor the progress over the course of a period of time and make changes based on that. We, so we've always done that. Um, we've built into our tool um, a couple of ways to do that. One is a more quantitative way where we're comparing the algorithm performance to actual scores that our humans perform every month. Um, you know that there's a recommendations basically given by our AI, but there's also that same report is reviewed by a human um, to evaluate if people adhered to that and, and what it should be. And we check if the automated recommendation was correct. So we're getting that validation pretty much every month. Um, so that, that's number one and evaluating over time. Number two for the, to the less robust way is making sure that there's a really great feedback mechanism between your radiologist users and the people that are creating the tool. It not only has to be a one-way feedback mechanism, it has to be two-way. The rads need to know you're listening to this feedback or they're gonna stop giving it and then you stop learning things. So those two are important. The, the third piece I would say that we've learned is that you have to monitor usage over time because even though you've got a tool and it's automated tool and everyone thinks, oh yeah, it's great, everyone's gonna use it, rads get in a habit of a, doing things a certain way and not everyone uses it. So you have to monitor not only the performance but also the usage. That's a key tip actually, something that people don't often uh, look at, I suppose. Um, I was gonna ask um, Luke, I know you've got strong opinions as well on generalizability problems and issues. Uh, so do you want to give your take on those? Um, specifically, I think I, I, want to, I want to target this as a more, more of a global thing. So I'm often asked, part of my role is helping people get regulatory approvals. You know, why, can, why can't I get a data set in France and get regulatory approval? And then someone in Germany has, says, oh, you must test it in Germany too. When clearly the two populations cannot be so dissimilar? Or is there some underlying thing that we're missing that, and actually they could be completely different? And I want to get your take on that. Yeah, look, obviously I have strong opinions. Uh, look, it's a really interesting topic for sure. That, um, you know, at this face value consideration, you're like, oh, you know, people aren't that different everywhere. In most tasks, bodies are roughly the same, even across ethnicities, even across geographic locations and so on. Um, you know, we're doing, MRI looking inside the body, we're all pretty much the same on the inside. So how can this be happening? But then we start doing the studies. And if you look across all of the published research with external validations, on average, you'll get a drop of sort of five to 10 points in AUC when you go to a new site. And so there's clearly something going wrong here. And the question is, what is it? So uh, Nina mentioned this term brittleness. And the question is, what does that actually mean? We're saying that the model has somehow decided to learn some features which are not reflective of the underlying truth of biology, right? That if they reflected biology, you know, disease, lung cancer is the same no matter where you are in the world, so it should work. Uh, but it has to be learning something that is not reflective of that underlying biology. And so then the question becomes, what is it learning? What, what are these non-robust features or non-causal features or brittle features that it's learning? Um, and the answer is really, it could be anything. But if you think about uh, sort of these data sets in, from this idea that they're really high dimensional uh, and very, you know, the, the interplay between pixel values and so on is so complex. It's very unlikely if you've got a large data set that you're gonna be learning um, macroscopically evident things. Things like, uh, you know, patients with a certain body size are more likely to have disease unless that's an actual truth to the biology. Um, so instead, what we usually what it seems we're finding in the ML literature at the moment is that these models are fitting on things like statistical noise in the image. They're fitting on things like, uh, you know, the, the background quantum model in a CT or uh, the detector noise and so on. Um, and those features are really hard to deal with. There was a, there was a comment in the, the chat of, uh, can we address this fragility just with more standardized acquisition? And so more standardized acquisition, you know, CT values range 
maybe 10 or 20% different across sites. And sure, it would be better if those things were standardized, but those are the sort of things we can also deal with with augmentation. We can just uh, manipulate the histogram of images. Um, but actually dealing with this noise that, that these models may be fitting on is, is super hard to do and super non-intuitive. Um, so I'm not sure how to do it. The one caveat I have is we have seen a couple of examples where models have generalized. Uh, there was uh, an example from a, a retinopathy paper produced in Singapore where they tested it uh, in Zambia, I believe. And the model performance, uh, the AUC ended up being 97. And they never reported what the original model performance was in Singapore, uh, but you know, presumably it kind of dropped more than two or three points because it's 97. So uh, it has to be very similar to that end. Uh, similarly, we've had a paper, uh, well, not published yet, that uh, we did an external validation on which showed maintained performance. And the thing that was similar between these two papers is the performance is super, super high. So the performance is, uh, in these cases, close to 100%, um, but is also fairly significantly above humans. And my feeling is in this training space where we're training you know, these models on complex data, if you're getting an average performance, you know, close to humans, around the 80s, something like that, depending on the task, uh, there's this huge scope that it could just be overfitting on random stuff in the images. But as you get towards the really, really high performance, and this is a hypothesis, I, I can't back this up at the moment, but as you get to really, really high performance, the chance that you could be getting that performance in a large data set just by overfitting on noise becomes vanishingly small. And so I feel like uh, there's probably a distinction here. Uh, I just can't back that up with, with evidence at the moment. I can well, talk someone about who can, someone who can is Sharon, whose PhD is literally on this topic. Um, <laughs> so you're, you're studying robustness with, with, by attacking machine learning algorithms with, with GANs. Is this correct? I love GANs, yes. So Do you much. want to just briefly, okay, here's, here's a challenge on the spot. One minute, GANs to the layperson, go. Oh my gosh, GANs are composed of two different models that fight each other, but through that fighting, one of them gets really good at generating really realistic uh, images, for example, or other things, but really realistic images that you and I can't tell apart as fake or real. And this is often the basis for deep fakes. Okay, was that Perfect. a minute? That was really good. I'm, GAN stands for Generative Adversarial Networks. Um, yes. So, uh, so Sharon, you're you're using these to see if we can improve the robustness of algorithms. Is that correct? Yes, I've definitely. Yeah, that definitely is one application of GANs. Um, I would say this general topic that we've been chatting about is known as distributional shift. So, like shift in the data distribution. Um, meaning it could go, it, the data distribution could be a different institution, but um, something that is really interesting is it doesn't have to be a different institution. It could be the same institution. And that could mean over time, uh, the prevalence changes, for example, like go with, with COVID and all of a sudden your model doesn't work on your same institution. And it's just like, what? And then I think another cool thing is um, uh, uh, your, the way your model's outputs are interpreted differently due to learning effects or over-reliance on the model, or just generally it's being interpreted differently because you have different RADs now, right? The model didn't change, your data didn't even change, but you have different RADs. Like there's so many different ways where essentially this interaction can shift that it's not accounted for. And that as humans, we're able to account for very easily, but these models just aren't able to. And um, to Luke's point around, um, having high accuracy and being able to avoid some of the, um, or become more robust, I would say it's kind of a delicate balance between uh, how, how complex and large your data set is and how big your model is. Because if your model has is super big, that means some of its parameters or some of the things it's learning or some of, its, some of the pieces of your model will not have even learned anything. So it'll just be random the whole time and it won't have learned anything. And then maybe your data shifts a little and then it'll start looking into those areas. And then your model is just producing gunk is what I call it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Matt, we've just had a quick fire question come in on the chat, which I know you know the answer to. Are there any public radiology images to play around with? 
yeah, yeah. There's lots of public radiology images. I think uh, there's a there's a few sites. I, we can try to send it out in an email link or something. There's a few sites that have really correlated them. We have several on our site as well, av.stanford.edu. Um, and then there are large efforts, just for those of you uh, interested in these things, uh, going on at the NIH. We've just had a large uh, funding mechanism come through for making lots more data sets available, including clinical data um, and annotations. And, you know, speaking of annotations, I, I, I did want to ask uh, whether everyone has seen this or not, but it does tend to be uh, with regard to um, generalizability, I do feel like some aspect of how well you have segmented or the more pixel related labeling you're doing tends to be the thing that of course we hate uh, because it's so much extra effort, but it does tend to create models that at least in our limited experience has generalized much better across institutions, which is our main metric. I think between machines, we can get around some of that, but I don't know if that's everyone else's experience too, but I'm curious to hear uh, if you've had to roll up your sleeves and do more segmentation because you just can't get there uh, with, with the study level labels or other slice labels. As a, as a really good example, there's a paper published, I think just, just this week uh, on, on comparison of three um, mammography um, AI systems. And the one that one um, had pixel level annotations and was trained on the largest data sets as well uh, across the broadest geography, which I which I found quite interesting. That is the same paper that that, that Luke fell in love with with the supplement section. Um, so we've put that link already in the in the YouTube. Uh, I, in the I think YouTube that's chat. a you know it's a great point. It, one thing to say about that is that uh, just because something's trained on more data doesn't necessarily mean it's better. So just to be, you know. Are you More data is good, but you want to do it correctly. So, or if the data are biased, um, you know. So, oh, yeah, if you, you can have the biggest data set in the world, but if it's completely biased, it's, it's going to be useless, right? Right. But all things being equal, more data is better. A hundred percent. But I, I've seen recently some vendors talking about, oh, our algorithm is better or our product is better because we trained on more cases and it's like well i'm glad you trained on more cases but that's that's not why you're better necessarily i just and what if you're using linear regression but you're training on more cases <laughs> <laughs> okay um, um i will say this is still hush hush, but I will say, I guess publicly, that I is, is this a world exclusive? <laughs> We're at, a, a world exclusive. Oh, uh, drum roll. Submission. But um, uh, there are definitely areas where less data is better. So, um, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Tell us more. And Sounds like thunder and bago. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, um, uh, I believe Nina touched on this a little bit around overfitting, but um, sometimes if you w really want good accuracy on a specific type of data, overfitting will help you. And of course, it, de it definitely depends on uh, kind of your what your base model looks like and what you're going to overfit to and how different that data is. So it, it definitely isn't like a there's not like a one statement thing of better, more data is better holding the model constant too. Like that, that also doesn't hold. So just cool. I mean, that is the thing. I mean, when you talk about overfitting, it's that you've, if you will, made a curve that goes around very specific points in your data. If the data distribution is going to stay the same, mm -hmm. overfit it to, you know, I mean, you, I mean, you can make a very precise pattern it's when you take that same algorithm and put it where the data aren't exactly the same that the overfitting causes problems so like if i'm going to build an algorithm to nina's point if i build an algorithm that works really really great in my own institution heck use it even if it doesn't work when i give it to my next door neighbor mm. That kind of answers another couple of questions that we've had in. We've got, got some big names coming in the chat. Alexandra kazan Chenever is here and Bjorn Jokke as well. So um, they're both asking a very similar question. What, how do we see um, institutions um, going? Are we going to go for 
trusting a regulated algorithm proven on many, many data sets across the globe, or if your own algorithm on your own data works better, shouldn't you just trust that? That's a very interesting question. Can I, can I pop in here? So yes. I, I'm, going to push, I'm, I'm going to push back against Rame a little bit here. So if your model works in your own data and it doesn't work in a different institution, why? And you know, I, I was talking about this before, that the only realistic answer to this is that it's learned features which are not relevant to the biology of disease, which should be consistent across sites. Unless you have a specific task where that's not true, then it's doing something that is unreliable. And you don't know how it's doing it. You don't know in which way it's unreliable. And one of the best framings of this issue I've seen is there's a paper about something called shortcut learning. Uh, this was published in the medical literature. And it's taking the same idea of brittleness and non-robustness and so on, but it's saying the model is learning a shortcut for the task that you care about. And that may be that it's learning to recognize a radiographic marker at the top of the image. It may be that it's learning to recognize features of gender instead of disease or something like that. Um, but it may also be that it's learning some random texture feature in the image. Um, and at, at a base level, if it's learning shortcuts, it's not doing what you want it to do. Um, so I would, I would push back against this idea that just because it works in your institution, that makes it fine. Um, it's definitely true that having some localized process is great. And, and if it works, it works. There's some truth to that. But what happens when you change scanners? What happens when you, you know, we buy new scanners every year at every institution. What happens when you change doctors? What happens when you change technicians? Wait, 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 wait. What, what kind of hospital do you work in? It buys a scanner every year. <laughs> X-ray scanners, surely. Um, the, wow. You know, mo mo most public centres have, have an upgrade time of, of five years or so for scanners, right? But oh. they're, they're buying some new scanners every now and then. It's not the UK, Hugh. It's not the UK. No, I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I saw a new scanner. We're still using ones from the 80s. We haven't got 64 slice CT yet. So it's really Luckily, ev joking. everything's generalizable on eight slices, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> those now, now those detectors are deteriorating, though. So, so your your imaging is still shifting, even if you're not getting these scanners. I, I think the key is in whatever algorithm you have, you have to monitor it over time. And the less generalizable it is, the more specific you have to be about that evaluation, because your data is going to drift over time, and there's not much you can do about it. But if we, like when we do a lot of NLP models, and if I had an NLP model that worked for one radiologist because it was trained on that radiologist reports, and all I was doing was NLP on that rad, you know what? I'm not gonna have a general model. I want the model that's trained specifically on that rad. It, it's the moment when I wanna bring in another radiologist or that radiologist decides they're going to use a new form of dictating. That's when you have to be careful. And so that's the, where the monitoring comes in. Yeah, and I, I think that that goes back. I mean, Luke was right. I mean, I, I said that incorrectly. That, that's one of those goon statements that we were talking about earlier. Uh, Tell us about the goons, Rain. The goons was in, in the pre-chat. Uh, Rain was, was telling us about how he used to joke and laugh about, about the goons. Now, before we explain, Rain, some of our listeners prepared to be offended. You will likely be classed as a goon by Rain, guys. This, this is my last time on this uh, thing. But... Uh, in a whole nother life, decades ago, I was an engineer, you know, in, in grad school at Stanford and in the med school. And uh, we all called the MDs their goons because even when they were talking at the, that time, I was dealing with fluid dynamics and ion and gas transport. But we would do the mathematical modeling or write the code to do things and the physicians knew just enough about it to be able to use it or give lectures on it, but they didn't really understand it. And I would sit in the audience, probably like Sharon is doing right now, or Luke, and listen to somebody like me talk and go, you know, he doesn't, he kind of gets it, but he doesn't really get it. And I do think that that is a problem that of at least a lot of us, maybe just hopefully just the ones with gray hair. Uh, <laughs> But it, it, it goes back to the thing of all of this stuff is more, in one sense, it's really easy to do again, to build a little algorithm that works. Making this stuff work in the wild, in production, that's a whole different beast. 
Um, and so there you have it, goons. <laughs> well, Matt, you're a goon. <laughs> oh, sorry, Nina, you're a goon too. Are you a goon? I don't know. No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, no. But... I don't want to offend anyone. I'm certainly a goon. I don't <laughs> do the coding. I don't. I, I don't do the coding side or, the, or anything. I, I I understand it enough to be able to talk to people. But I think also, Rain, and I think you'll agree here, it's important to be able to have, be able to speak a little of the languages of both worlds in radiology and data science. Absolutely, having knowledge and then just respecting the other side uh, is yeah. <laughs> that's the only way this is going to move forward. Yeah. Exactly. And I think they're goons on both sides. Yeah, everyone's a goon to Speaking someone else. from the technology right? side, they're definitely goons over here. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, are they ever going to let you have this uh, program again now that we've I, crashed? I, it could be pulled off the air any moment now. I'm just waiting for the hook to come through. <laughs> Rain, Rain, this is nothing. Two weeks ago, I think we, we, had, we had interviews with turkeys on a farm. Like, so this is <laughs> <Yeah>. fine. <laughs> Sorry, Nina, you were going to say something. Of any censor, this is going to be great. Is... <laughs> okay. Well, no, I want, I, I love the point that you made, Hugh, about, I mean, those of us that are goons, I'm included, right? You don't have to be the expert SME um, it, about all things. What, what I found that people really need, and, and to encourage radiologists, you don't need to know all of the statistics. You don't need to know all the different algorithms. But what you do need to know is what you alluded to is you need to be able to translate between the two. How do you translate between the clinical and the use case and then you know, to, to the data scientists and what tools can do? And I find that a lot of radiologists are really able to do that. And that's something I would encourage many, many more radiologists to get involved because it only helps on both sides. Yeah, I would second that. I think understanding the, the fundamental concepts and principles, you know, we always use this analogy of, you know, we still have to take physics boards and learn how MRIs operate. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we don't have to learn to build an MRI machine, as, as we usually say. And so, you know, the, the, but you have to be able to know enough to, to, uh, to, to converse and, and be, I guess, bilingual. I also look at it from a generalist and specialist, very med medical centric sort of viewpoint. But, you know, imagine that, you know, you know enough to know when to consult the cardiologist or uh, the pulmonologist when you're, you know, you're in a place that that particular problem needs it needs an expert in that area. So again, if I need a deep fake, I'm going to call up Sharon right now and say, uh, I know the specialist that I need to, uh, to superimpose my image on many things, um, whatever I need. <laughs> to that point, I wonder, I wonder, I'd like to ask everybody else if you think it's, is, could this evolve sort of like radiation therapy where you have the medical physicist come in every morning and do some check and then once a week they do an entire simulation to make sure all the equipment's running correctly do you think we'll end yes. up having people like that in radiology for machine learning i i, I absolutely do and, and i wrote about this in a blog about three years ago that, 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 that there's going to be a new profession of this kind of technologist role um, in the radiology department yeah, in, in Australia, we uh, our, our college has produced a standards document which suggests that every practice should have a, a chief AI officer and, and they should be medically trained and they should be uh, aware enough of the issues with these systems to be able to monitor them effectively, which would include things like auditing, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking for edge cases and, and the kind of failure modes that you might not expect and so on. Um, you know, obviously that's a tough ask for a lot of practices that may only have a few doctors. Um, but it's, as you say, it's like having a medical physicist. Big practices have them. Small practices have someone that maybe is a bit interested in the topic if they're doing something that requires it. Um, you know, in, in radiology in general, we have this huge collection of people that do things like this. It's not just medical physicists. Uh, we have highly trained technicians in MRI and CT and so on. Um, we have service contracts with the major companies. So, it's, you know, we've got these uh, huge infrastructure in place to make sure things are operating properly. And I think it's fair to say that AI models are at least as dangerous as scanners. So maybe we need a huge infrastructure in place, not just one expert. I, just a sh shameless plug for SIMS, Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine. Right now they have a 
certification or developed a certification, the SIP, Certified Imaging Informatics Professional. And now SIM is seriously considering, are we going to need a training? What training do we need and how? what sort of certification do we need for these, what we call at the moment, SIP pluses? Uh, people who understand some imaging informatics and the appropriate things for machine learning. And we're assuming uh, that those people are actually probably going to not come out of traditional imaging informatics right at the moment, but a lot of them are going to come out of uh, computer science or DevOps or systems engineering. Um, and we're reaching out to those people you know, we've had talks, uh, well, with Terry Sippel Schmidt at, uh, in Wisconsin. And I've talked to the people at CMU and MIT about that. Uh, and there's a lot of interest, at least, in trying at least to figure out what those people, what we, somebody like that needs to know. And we haven't gotten around to the certification yet, but. Anybody who wants to participate in that, who's listening on this conversation, please let me know or let uh, uh, Sim know. There we go. Nina, do you have a AI technologist lead person who does all the bits and bobs that we've discussed? We are developing, so it used to be just um, me, that was running a lot of the AI stuff and the pilots. And we had quantitative metrics that we would pull for every single one so that we knew that we had some kind of standardization. We're now bringing to the table a lot more of a cross-functional team. So we do, we have people from IT operations, strategy, uh, radiology, clinical value, um, and, and project management all coming together because I think you do need a cross-functional team. We don't have a physicist type of person right now, but I think that that is something that's evolving. Nina, have you guys have you guys worked out? And this is fascinating because I think that we're all in the same place where we have governance, we have ideas of which uh, processes we need to put in place as we go. But you know, one of the things that I think is still eluding everyone to some extent is is the utility analysis. So you know, if I have a bunch to choose from that all perform relatively similarly. Uh, how do I, you know, what's worth the effort to implement in the first place? I mean, how, how do I get a handle on metrics that help me? Um, that, I feel like it's it's because it depends, obviously it depends on the stakeholders, but I think that's one of the most difficult discussions I think that we have, and I'm sure you're having in your practice, but do, do you guys, have you guys solved or thought a lot about that? Is it a rubric? How do you say, okay, this is worth doing. This is not gonna save dollars time enough to, to be worth the, the, the work. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We started doing this back before AI. So, well, before we started using AI anyway, when we thought about what can we use with just change management and, and how can we improve the radiologist capabilities and the effect on patient care, we came up with like this huge list of ideas. And then, well, how do you decide which to do exactly what you're saying? It was the same problem. And we came up with our list of things. So we wanted something that was common. Right? It would affect a lot of people. It could be a super awesome algorithm, but if it only affects like such a small patient population, it wasn't what we wanted to do first. And actually our very first one, we said we wanted it was something that could be successful, which may not be something that you always think of first, that you're gonna get a, a high, high success rate. But for your first one, you wanna make sure that you go out with a bang. We look for things that um, affect the different stakeholders in radiology. So for the patient, hopefully it can improve their outcomes, um, decrease unnecessary utilization, which payers also like. You look for what affects the client hospitals and they want something that is generally different. They want something that's going to bring patients back to their, their hospital or decrease length of stay. Um, and, and then the radiologist, you know, we're looking for something to improve quality, but efficiency at the same time. So we looked at all of those. When we started doing that for AI, we realized we had to come down to more one main thing that was going to separate a lot of the other stuff for us. Uh, and, and that one main thing that we ended up coming down on um, 
well, I suppose it's not fair. It's not really one. I suppose it's two. We won't look at anything unless it's improving some kind of quality metric, if it's driving some kind of value. So, so like that aside. But once you get that, we actually are looking at things that will drive efficiency. I don't think we have enough radiologists to go around. The workload is not getting any better. Um, I, I think it's only going to continue to get worse. And I feel like we've lost a lot of the quality that we're able to provide because we don't have the capacity to do it. Yeah, I, I guess measuring these outcomes and metrics is kind of the next step in, in the whole sector. Getting a health economics argument, getting an efficiency argument. Um, and that's a whole area of scientific research, which many of us as radiologists or even data scientists don't really have much experience in. Building health economics models for, for the impact of drugs, for instance, is a huge project. It can take years to build an effective statistical model and payment model for that. And I'm not yet aware of any published evidence of health economics arguments for, for, for machine learning models. And this links really nicely into the last question that I wanted to ask you guys, bearing in mind we have about five minutes left. Um, how far away are we from models that can actually provide significant value? Bearing in mind the vast majority of the clinical decision support models that we're talking about only find one pathology on a scan when obviously we know that we don't just, don't just look for one pathology at a time. So how far away are we from actually seeing real value? Silence, amazing. Well, I'm real value. I'll start. I, 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 hate to, I hate to not jump in on silence. Um, so no, I, I think that uh, if you're talking about upstream, you know, the quote unquote uh, delineations, we like to use these terms uh, upstream, that's, I, I believe the value is probably fairly baked in, in terms of reducing scan time, for example. I think there's some things that economically make a lot of sense. We've spent some time on clinical decision support, I think, so pro, you know, prior to the actual imaging even being done, clearly, you know, lower utilization or unnecessary utilization. But I think that for for a clinical application, um, you know, if it's not if it's not part of already at least in this you know healthcare ecosystem baked into some kind of a metric, quality metric, hospitalization metric, readmission, you know, they're giving the right antibiotic for a pneumonia. If it's not baked into that. I think it's going to be a while because again, we're still in this very much a, a very, we're already pretty efficient as radiologists. And if you're still, a, if you're only picking up a few things and I still have to look at all the images, hard to know if we're going to get to that place uh, for some time. I actually have a bit of a different view on that. Um, you know, it's interesting. We, when we first did some pilots, we did a pilot with a triage product and I was talking to someone and they said, well, triage, like there's no, there's not such a great use case. I mean, and especially for us in the part of the organization I was reading in, we do all of our exams in 30 minutes. So triaging in 15 versus 30 is not making a huge difference. But what we found in actually employing that model is that there are side benefits that you don't realize. Number one, we got efficiency improvements. Number two, we use it as a peer learning, well, not a peer learning, a machine learning tool, right? To teach our radiologists, what are the things that we tend to be missing? And when we did studies, it actually decreased, it increased radiologist satisfaction and generally decreased radiologist burnout. So that's one side. I think that there's benefits to even the single model of what it can do already that people may not be thinking about. And then on the other side, it's a spectrum. I mean, there's already groups that, for a chest x-ray can find 24 different things. Um, and I think that will come first. You'll get like one type of study where you can have a whole generalizable area. And then the last point is that there's the back end, which I don't think people are concentrating on enough, but if we could do use AI to normalize our data and use it to drive contextual driven workflows that maybe you don't see as a radiologist, I think that will actually have the biggest impact. There's, I think there's some low hanging fruit as well that, um, you know, there's the two main application areas uh, that are being heavily targeted and within the next year or two, you know, we saw the paper yesterday, mammography is a single question problem uh, and a model that can solve that single question problem as well or better than a radiologist will have a significant a disruptive impact to that field. Uh, similarly with diabetic retinopathy assessment, um, you know, potentially vastly expanding coverage for diabetic retinopathy assessment would have a huge impact as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think everything that Nina said is fantastic that, uh, you know, we've got 
a range of flow-on effects that aren't immediately obvious. Um, and this is why we need to do outcomes or, or uh, utility testing for these models that um, even if a model only looks maybe as good as, as something and doesn't look like it'll save time, you may get some really significant improvements in, in satisfaction and workflow and so on. Matt, I was going to ask you, uh, have you at Stanford deployed and are using in clinical workflow or are you still in research phase for your algorithms? Yeah, I mean, things here are still treated as clinical trials. Um, we finished one and have one in production, um, but we don't have commercial vendors uh, for cleared solutions running in the workflow now. I mean, there are um, sort of different things in like a 3D lab kind of a circumstance, but not in the high volume uh, aspect at this point. And I was gonna ask Sharon actually, from someone who's building these things, are these considerations ever brought up from a kind of data science angle that actually what I'll be trying to build here, is it not only technically possible, but is it actually useful? Definitely. Um, well, I guess it depends on who you're speaking with and what their incentives are. So I guess someone who wants to do something in the private sector um, like build a company, for example, they would definitely have to think that through and think through the financials and whether something like that would deliver enough financial value and fit into the current workflow. And I think on the research side, um, I think folks are motivated by various things as well. And there could be one is, is this novel enough to be publishable? Um, sorry for my cynicism around research. Uh, and, uh, but then there are also there's also that small subset of humans who care about impact and like, will this actually be um, impactful to a, a good number of people and will it realistic? And then there, are, of course, you also maybe have to be practical on some level, like, will this realistically be able to be put out? And I think there are multiple stages to getting a technology out and it definitely, you know, there's like cool machine learning problems, technical ones, but that's not the hardest technical problem probably like the hardest one is definitely deployment and making something actually useful and um, useful for a long time, not just a one-off and not to just make something shiny. So um, there's a ways to go, but um, yeah, it depends on the person. Any final thoughts, anyone else? We've got one more minute to wrap up. Anyone want to give the final sermon? I'll say one thing. Yeah. The, you know, I, when I look at an algorithm, I'm not basing it on the AUC, the true positives, true negatives. I'm actually basing a huge amount on what the vendor is like to work with. When, when you're deploying these algorithms in real life, you need a partner. You don't want a vendor. And so look for people you can partner with because you're going to have problems and you want someone to help you solve them. Excellent top tip. And on that bombshell I think we're going to have to close up we didn't even get onto some of the other topics we haven't talked about continuous learning we haven't talked about causality and understanding that we haven't even talked about my surprise topic which I wanted to ask people about which is something called hop field networks but maybe we can all think about that for, for, for all the you next need. time <laughs> they are all you need indeed um, I don't understand them yet I just read the words and, and so I'm going to read that paper um, so thank you so much, Rain Guys, Nina Kotler, Luke Oaks, Matt Langwood, Sharon Zhu. You've all been fantastic. Thank you to the audience for, for asking your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get around to all of them. There will be another uh, session. I think it's, in, it's in every two weeks. Is that correct, Matt? Every month. We try to do every month. End of the month. Yeah. And we'll let you know. And the video will be available on YouTube shortly after. But that's it all. That's all, folks. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thanks.